right, y'all. Welcome to the Scott Horton Show. I am the director of the Libertarian Institute, editorial director of Antiwar.com, author of the book Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, and I've recorded more than 5,000 interviews going back to 2003, all of which are available at scotthorton.org. You can also sign up for the podcast feed. The full archive is also available at youtube.com slash Show. Hey yep. guys, on the line, I've got the great Grant Smith. He's the founder and the director of the Institute for Research, Middle Eastern Policy, IRMEP, I-R-M-E-P dot org, IRMEP. And we run everything he writes at antiwar.com, of course. Welcome back to the show. How you doing, man? I'm doing great, Scott. Thanks for having me on. Uh, very happy to have you here. We got so many things to talk about. First of all, you wrote a bunch of books, Big Israel and uh, Divert about uh, the Israelis stealing uh, weapons-grade uranium from uh, America. And uh, before that, uh, I forgot them all, but a whole bunch of them. And they're all about the Israel lobby and Israeli agents in the United States getting away with things. And now uh, you are publishing the Institute for Research Middle Eastern Policy. Earmap.org is publishing a new book by a man named Walter L. Hickson called Architects of Repression. How Israel and its lobby put racism, violence, and injustice at the center of U.S. Middle East policy. Wow, what a title. Who's Walter Hickson? Yeah, so Walter Hickson is a uh, historian, distinguished professor at the University of Akron up until recently, who's been published by all sorts of mainstream academic publishers, and he's written his second book now about the Israel lobby, which will be broadly available in paperback, audiobook, uh, and Kindle uh, next week on the 7th. In fact, I think you can already get the audiobook right now. But anyway, this book, I mean, it could be called Case Closed, Israel and its U.S. lobby have been the main obstacles to peace uh, since 1948, because that's essentially what it proves through just a damning series of, uh, again, main mainstream, hardcore, archival historian research, fully cit citation or full citations and uh, just a incredibly damning uh, indictment of what's been going on. Great. I can't wait to read it. If yeah, I, so check it out. I and... need it to be a science fiction episode in my life where I can stop time for, like, I don't know, a summer <laughs> and catch up on all the books I got to read. What am I going to do? Anyway, I can't well, wait. Hey, I mean, this looks amazing. Yeah, I mean, if you just want to... I, I know, Scott, that, you know, you've got a lot of free time, so if you want to listen to the audiobook version, I can send you a free code. Oh, that's fact, even worse. No, I mean... I, <laughs> I have no time whatsoever. I can read yeah. three times faster and I can listen to anything, but. Uh, okay. Well, it's, uh, you know, it's one of those things. Um, anyone who really likes this sort of book can uh, definitely drop us an email at info at IRMEP.org. And we're happy to send you a free audiobook code if you want to review it on Amazon and Audible. Awesome. That yeah, sounds so like a got, deal. We That's got 50 that... sitting here, unused, 50 of them sitting right here. All right. So when they go to IRMEP.org, then what do they click? Uh, there's nothing on IRMEP. We haven't oh. launched it yet, but drop drop an email to info at oh, IRMEP.org. Oh, I'm sorry. I should have been listening better. I was reading the book instead of listening. <laughs> don't, don't read the book. Listen to the book. So, yeah, drop us an email, and we can send you a free code to listen to the audio book and review it. Mm -hmm. I just flip open to John Hagee attributed Rabin's death to his, quote, fanatical pursuit of peace. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds about right. Yeah, uh, wow. it's kind Something of like, else. Every, yeah, everything about this, oh, the Palestinians never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity type garbage is really psychological projection. And Hickson just rips his stuff apart. I mean, he's been just immersed in just about every American Israel Public Affairs Committee issue of their Near East report since it started coming out mm -hmm. and he just rips to shreds every single assertion versus what was actually happening at the time. Yeah. All right. Listen, uh, we got to talk more business before we get to your uh, article here. And that is 
the upcoming conference, the 2021 yeah. virtual edition of the Israel Lobby Con annual yep. series and U.S. support for Israeli apartheid. Tell me all about it and uh, how people can participate. Yeah, so we're announcing speakers and speaker lineups next week. And if people want to check out and register for that free Israel Lobby Con, it's at www.israelapartheidcon.org. And it's all about these ongoing um, damning pieces of evidence coming out of the UN, coming out of observers on the ground, and now the new Betselem report about. Uh, just the uh, quest for separateness and how much uh, the Israel lobby is fighting that uh, tooth and nail. And we've got an incredible lineup of speakers uh, who will be talking about that in two sessions. And it's also focusing for the first time, you know, Scott, normally we do this at the National Press Club right before the meeting of the American Israel Public Affairs Committee. But this year we're doing it right before and right after the convening of J Street, the liberal Israel lobby group. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, so we'll have some keen uh, analysts looking at what they're saying and doing uh, in their conference. Most of the session one that we're doing right before their conference will be looking at the Israel lobby and apartheid question. And then after the uh, J Street conference, we're doing another Saturday session starting at 11 a.m. talking about J Street and the Biden administration. So it's a really interesting wraparound that we're doing, uh, obviously enabled by technology. We're bringing in some speakers we could never quite bring in uh, from overseas and remote parts of the country like Texas and California. So it should be a really interesting conference this year. We're treating it with the seriety of a conference. It's not going to be one of these things where you see a bunch of people sitting, you know, sitting on a couch and with terrible audio and video if we can help it. And it's, it's going to have the same sort of crisp, focused uh, pace along with Q&A. So I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be a great conference. Yeah. And you know what? Uh, next year in D.C., we'll get it done again. Yeah, uh, absolutely. 2022, we still have a huge thing. Uh, the 2022 conference, you know, you can check out that conference at Israel Lobby Con with Roger Waters and Gideon Levy and uh, just a host of incredible speakers. Uh, we managed to reschedule that twice, but uh, National Press Club. I love that uh, Gideon Levy. <laughs> Man, I got to start reading but, him more often again. You know, he's amazing in person when you can talk to him. Oh, he's just him, great. His speech was just him. incredible that yeah. what, a few and, years ago. I saw you know, him. all these speakers make themselves available, and you can't, you can't replicate that on Zoom. So, yeah. you know, we're really looking forward to getting back to our natural habitat, which is the National Press Club. Yeah. So, yeah, check out Israel Lobby Con dot org slash 2022 dash conference or just after, go to Israel after Lobby you Con. check out israel apartheid con.org which is this year yeah yeah yes. coming up this month this month oh yes it's already april isn't it goodness yes sir uh so, and this is the again, 17th and the 24th and the 24th correct i see so registration is open and then gobs of speaker information coming out next week all right cool well listen grant i mean that sounds absolutely great dude uh and I've been to these in person before, and and they're just excellent. And uh, definitely, we'll be covering this at antiwar.com and at the institute and everything else. And um, and then, like you say, in fact, you know what? I'll have you back next week to talk about who all is speaking because I know it's going to be an impressive list. Yeah, I'd appreciate that. the The bios of these people are a mile long, and I think it's really important to understand what they're bringing to the table. I mean, yeah. at this day and age, anyone can do a Zoom. Uh, convocation. But again, we put the same amount of time and effort into choosing the speakers and working out with them what they're talking about. So it should be awesome. Yeah. Hey, y'all, Scott here. If you want a real education in history and economics, you should check out Tom Woods's Liberty Classroom. Tom and a really great group of professors and experts have put together an entire education of everything they didn't teach you in school, but should have. Follow through from the link in the margin. At scotthorton.org for Tom Woods' Liberty Classroom. 
Look here, you and I both know that what you need is some Libertarian Institute things. Like shirts and sweatshirts and mugs and stickers to put on the back of your truck. And to give to your friends too that say Libertarian Institute on them. So that everyone will know the origins of your oppositional defiant disorder and where they can listen to all the best podcasts. So here's what you do. Go to LibertasBella.com and look at all the great Libertarian Institute stuff they've got going there. Find the ad in the right-hand margin at LibertarianInstitute.org. LibertasBella.com um, And now, let's get to the heart of the segue of the thing from the subject of the conference to your new piece running at Antiwar.com from uh, March the 30th here. Cut aid over Israeli apartheid. Say Americans. So, um, how about the word apartheid is an emotional trigger for yeah. some people, and they yeah. either say, oh my God, Israel is got an apartheid situation going on over there, or they say something maybe like, how dare you say that? Or maybe they're confused and would just ask, what do you mean by that exactly, Grant Smith? Yeah, well, you know, apartheid is just an Afrikaans word meaning separateness or... The state of being apart, literally apartheid. So that's what it means. It means that you're putting together a systemic uh, separation uh, based on some distinguishing characteristic between the peoples over whom you're ruling. And of course, you know, the word is pertaining to South Africa. The word is supposed to uh, you know, be thought of in that term originally, but now it's increasingly been brought up to refer to what uh, the Israeli government has done to the Palestinians living within the confines of the state and also the territories it controls in the West Bank, uh, I would add East Jer Jerusalem, Gaza. And, you know, this issue keeps coming up. The UN Economic and Social Commission for West Africa came out with a report in 2017 clearly stating that the situation on the ground was apartheid. And so, you know, they managed to pressure the UN Secretary General to pull that report to say that this unit of the UN wasn't authorized to do that report. And, you know, Richard Falk and some of the other people, like the executive secretary who wrote the report, Rima Khalaf. You know, she resigned. So there's been this growing uh, awareness of the situation that it is, in fact, a, a systematic imposition of separation. Um, but Israel and its U.S. lobby simply don't want to deal with that. OK, so I'm interested in uh, what you think of this piece in the Jerusalem Post here. Um, I'm not sure if you saw this, but I would bet that you did. Uh, that the Biden administration published their 2020 yeah. country reports on human rights practices. And right. even though they treat Trump's uh, moving the embassy and recognizing all of Jerusalem as Israel's capital, in other words, not the capital of an independent Palestine ever, and yeah. their um, annexation of the Golan Heights, that they did uh, refer to, it's interesting the way they do this, um, uh, they kept in place a description change made to the report by former President Trump in which he replaced the phrase Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories with mm -hmm. Israel, the West Bank and Gaza. Mm -hmm. But within the report, the Biden administration reintroduced the word occupied to describe right. Israel's capture of territory during the 1967 Six Day War. But I wonder if that is just essentially public relations against the notion of apartheid that in fact, you know, this, the people on the West bank are not the subjects of Israel. It might be apartheid if they were, but in fact, no, they're just occupied uh, presumably temporarily and, you know, under their own, this Palestinian authority, pseudo government kind of thing. And then, so that mm -hmm. way they get to split the difference and devolve the responsibility away. Um, right. Is that what's going on with uh, that's that's the J Street angle, right, is focus on the two state solution that will never come. But just to right. obfuscate the fact that it's already one state that they annexed de facto or de jure or however you want to call it 
all of the West Bank back in 67 and, and certainly in the last years have made that clear that they're never giving it up. Yeah, so the Jerusalem Post and some other Israeli newspapers that parse carefully through the State Department, you know, report card did note that the word occupation crept back in. But, you know, the I, I think the analogy of the ratchet where if the Trump made a horrible, you know, completely, uh, I would say, illegitimate proclamation that the Israelis do in fact uh, get to uh, have sovereignty over the occupied Golan Heights and this and that, that that you just can't ratchet that back. And so that would have been meaningful if the uh, Biden administration in their so-called you know human rights and uh, scorecard report had said, yeah, actually the Golan Heights, uh, much as we have disputes with Syria, is actually Syrian territory. So we're going to say occupied Golan Heights and as well as occupied West Bank, blah, blah, blah. That would have been, you know, turning the ratchet back, but they didn't do that. So I would tend to side with you that returning to some mild uh, rebuke by calling the West Bank uh, occupied uh, is really just PR. If the Trump administration had, uh, I might add, against American public opinion and against the public opinion of the world, uh, recognized Israeli sovereignty over the West Bank or pieces of the West Bank that the Israelis had designated their own territory. I'm pretty sure Biden and Tony Blinken would have taken that word out because, again, U.S. foreign policy and you know the uh, uh, the proclamations like this are a one-way ratchet. They never go back. Yeah, well, um, that's, you know, a great paraphrase of Robert Higgs there <laughs> and how that works, the ratchet effect there. Yeah, um, yeah. So, I mean, I love that analogy. And now, so the Betzalem report, the, right. in, the, in the context in which they phrase it, they're saying then that the two-state solution is moot. It is one state, and that's what makes it apartheid the way it's set up now. Is that correct then? That's that's correct. I mean, the Betzalem report is something everybody should read. It's not that long. It's called a, re a regime. Well, no, it's called This is Apartheid, a regime of Jewish supremacy from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. And they go through case by case why there are separate rights, no matter where the Israeli regime is operating within its own territory or within occupied territories that it's created this system of apartness. And depending where you live and work, you get different permits, different social benefits, different rights to vote. You know, that's if you're lucky enough to be in East Jerusalem. But if you're in the West Bank, you're just basically a subject. You've got different systems uh, of military control, uh, exercising authority over your life if you're in the Gaza Strip. You know, even though they withdrew, you still got the Israelis uh, surrounding the place and you get to live under a life of absolute control. So, you know, Bet Salem is basically boiling down uh, sort of region by region uh, all of the rights and separateness of Palestinians versus uh, Israelis by religion in terms of immigration, in terms of freedom of movement. Uh, in terms of who's deciding what can happen uh, and, you know, the takeover, the constant encroachment and uh, seizure of land, et cetera, et cetera. And it's just boiling all of that down and saying this fits the definition of apartheid. And there is, you know, again, the J Street and others uh, who say, oh, no, there can be two states, blah, blah, blah. They don't go this far because they don't want to confront the reality that that if it ever really was a bona fide attempt to uh, resolve the situation it certainly isn't now and so this Betzalem report is extremely critical in saying let's not pretend anymore this is apartheid it extends far beyond uh, you know just what Israel is doing in the occupied territories it's also present within the country mm. and then I know that your uh, expertise is about the 
Israel lobby, you know, and their Israel affinity right. groups here in the United right. States. But in your understanding of Israeli politics, is there anybody <laughs> other than Bethlehem, there's, you know, a couple of kind of leftist groups now that Yuri Avnery is dead? Uh, is there anybody apart from the editorial page over at Haaretz and and this one big peace group who actually, you know, care about this issue at all or push for the idea that, you know, as Ehud Barak said years ago, the former prime minister and defense minister, that, hey, we're looking at apartheid. We need to let the West Bank go or we're not going to be able to have Israel at all. I mean, is, <laughs> is anybody else saying that right now? Uh, you know... Unfortunately, no significant population. I mean, there are good guys all over the place sure. who recognize what's going on. Yeah, I mean, but... I, I, I meant factions, but of course, yes, individuals are good on it. Yeah. No, I mean, if you look at polls of Israelis, um, there seems to be uh, majority support for separation. It depends on how you phrase it, but, you know, when they came out with their basic law, that Israel was a nation state of the Jewish people and that passed, you know, there was broad support for that. So, you know, I don't think anyone's fielding polls saying, do you support uh, apartheid? I think what they are doing is fielding polls saying, do, do you approve of this sort of separation? And that, that enjoys overwhelming support. So I don't think it is a big concern. And again, there are groups that are under constant attack for their foreign funding and for their sort of resistance to uh, bending a knee toward the uh, Israeli government. And Beth Salem is one of them. And some people at Har Haaretz are, are, you know, frankly looking at the situation. Others aren't. But uh, they're a small group, tiny group. All right. Well, All right. it's just, it's such a paradox that it's such an untenable situation, and yet it seems so tenable somehow still. Well, I think it's tenable because kind of the gist of the article, and, you know, I guess, you know, depending on when we did the poll, obviously we did this poll as kind of a tie-in to the conference, but, you know, looking at U.S. support for Israel from the standpoint of you know your average American who hears that there's this group in Israel that's now condemning what's going on on the ground as, as being apartheid. I, it, to me, it was kind of surprising that a third of Americans are okay with that. And you know, they the question specifically was, should Israel be the leading aid recipient of the U.S. given this situation documented by an Israeli uh, rights group? And 33% of Americans said, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> so I don't think it would take a great deal more to bump that up. And again, I focus on the Israel lobby because it's been working really hard to quash this uh, growing awareness mm -hmm. of what uh, Israel has, is doing and has been doing. They have to quash this. They do not want this to be widely debated. And so that's, I think that's kind of the value of doing the first and only survey of Americans who are, who are basically subsidizing all of this yeah. uh, about Which, By the way, on. don't bury the lead because, in fact, the plurality, uh, it, Sort of significant 5% more said that actually, no, we should cut them off if that's the way they're going to do business, right? That is true. And so that's pretty good. It, uh, you know, yeah. I mean, I'm not going to say that I was hoping for more because what I was hoping for was to get a snapshot of what's going on right now. Sure. And so that I think the fact that people tie the two issues together and are are saying, yeah, things like that should have consequences. Yeah, I think that's interesting. But, um, you know, that's the value of doing uh, polling in a platform, again, that beats Gallup, hands down, uh, Google surveys, expensive but worth it, uh, to see what people think. I mean, it's, I think it's, it's interesting that 38.1%, a plurality, uh, say that. But you would think that it might be more if people kind of even tied that back to, um, you know, South Africa or discrimination that's happening in the U.S. and other things like that. So I don't know. 
we'll see. You know, this, I think this is a poll that could be done, uh, in future years. We also typically run a series asking what Americans think about Israel's position as the U S recipient of foreign aid, since it's gotten the lion's share since 1948. And these things do change over time. Um, and I think the lobby is going to have to work overtime. And we mentioned some of the pushback from APAC, the ADL, and some other organizations. Every time this allegation comes up, whether it was, you know, Jimmy Carter raising it with his 2006 book, Palestine, Peace, Not Apartheid, or John Kerry in 2014, or the squad and some other Dems when they were pushing back against annexation in the summer of 2020. I mean, every time the words aid and apartheid come up, there's the Israel lobby. So that's, of course, of everlasting fascination to us. Yeah. All right. Well, great work as always. Tell us again about the book and the conference now, Grant. So the book, the book uh, is Architects of Repression. It's by Walter Hickson. It's coming out uh, next week. And people can go to Middle East Books and More uh, to buy the book. They can go to a little book website called Amazon.com and get the book. Uh, and they can also get it in Audible and ebook formats. And again, if anyone wants to review the audiobook and submit comments about whether they liked it, didn't like it, or whatever, we've got 50 free audio book uh, giveaways that we can give to people who want to be reviewers and listen to it for free. Pretty long book. It's over 12 hours. It's got a lot of content, but send an email to info at irmep.org and we'll send you a free link to listen to the book. So we're excited about this book. Case closed. I mean, it really has been Israel and its lobby that's thwarted peace since 1948. This book presents that damning case. And then Israel apartheidcon.org. Check that out. Uh, we've got the conference coming up on the 17th and 24th. Free tickets are available there. So register and come and listen to the incredible lineup of speakers we're announcing next week. All right. That's great. And that's uh, israelapartheidcon.org. And I'll have you back on next week to talk all about that again, too. Hey, I appreciate it, Scott. All right. Good times. Thanks very much, Grant. Thank you. Talk soon. The Scott Horton Show, Anti-War Radio, can be heard on KPFK 90.7 FM in L.A., APSradio.com, Antiwar.com, ScottHorton.org, and LibertarianInstitute.org.